Good afternoon. The interviews are coming fast and furious here at IAC 2024. Um, we are joined today by a gentleman who knows a lot about in situ resource utilization, something I talk about all the time on the channel. Would you be so kind as to introduce yourself to the viewers? Yeah, I'm Daniel Sachs. I'm the founder and CEO of CSMC, the Canadian Space Mining Corporation. Uh, we are a uh, dual-use technology company focused on solving long-term problems in space that address immediate challenges on Earth. And we do that in three areas, in, in resources, which is the uh, ISRU side of the business, in energy, which is a nuclear power business, and then in healthcare. Wow. Quite a, quite a lot of things to take care of, definitely there. So tell me, I mean, in regards to uh, what do you th see as being the most important resources that we need to exploit out in space? Number one, to be successful in terms of establishing ourselves out there permanently. But number two, bringing back things valuable here to where it's justifiable to do it in the first place. Yeah, so, so I guess there's a different ways of thinking about it. To me, it's um, there's a lot of things that are of value. It's where do they fit on the timeline? And what are like first order problems? What are later order problems? So you know, there's a lot of hype and talk around like helium-3. Uh, helium-3, really valuable for fusion reactors, right? Um, fusion reactors are probably uh, not going to have a significant market demand until like 2040, probably 2040 five or later. Um, and so there's no immediate need for helium three, you know, we need to prepare, we need to uh, gather samples, figure out how to work with it, uh, figure out how to process it, um, and figure out how we're going to get it back eventually. But, you know, to the extent that you bring it back now, it's an uneconomic activity. Um, and there's no real societal value to doing so. Um, I think for us, the initial thing of value in the lunar environment, and we're really focused on the lunar environment more than we are like asteroids and, and other stuff like that, um, is oxygen and hydrogen. Um, you know, it's the ability to uh, refuel rockets, um, oxygen, hyd hydrogen, and, and of course, methane, um, you know, if that fits uh, within the architecture. Um, and so, so that's what I would consider like the first order problem. You have to create a sustainable presence on the moon. You have to be able to get uh, back to the moon. You have to be able to uh, refuel in orbit, potentially set up uh, fuel depots um, in LEO and, and MEO and GEO um, and, and kind of the, the cis lunar space. Um, and all of that, you know, builds off oxygen and hydrogen. Um, then from there, you open up stuff around the byproducts, right? So initially, there's probably not a huge market for the byproducts, but later, you know, when you get to in-space manufacturing, maybe you want sources of um, aluminum and titanium that are actually coming from the lunar environment instead of bringing them up from Earth, maybe for constructing space stations or simpler things, um, just ba basic structures, or maybe even... Uh, manufacturing crude satellites or solar panels. Um, so, so, so those to me are kind of like second order issues. They're byproducts of the first order problem. Um, um, but, you know, during the initial phase of first order um, for making propellant the, uh, and water, you probably don't need all the byproducts. So you're probably storing them in, in some capacity. It's not like you can 3D print all of them or, or do enough useful things with them. But, but over, over time you can, right? And and you build kind of increasing manufacturing capacity in space, and then you need those uh, raw materials. And then we get into stuff like, obviously, uh, precious metals and, and critical minerals. Um, I personally don't really see the argument of bringing precious metals back here. Like, um, bringing gold back here sounds good. I, I, I fail to see what good it does society, um, other than for, like, industrial uses. Um uh, to me, life is too short to waste on kind of useless bullshit, and and the idea of like bringing gold back to to crash the world's gold market, you know, is just a stupid fucking pursuit that is a waste of of uh, society's resources in my mind. Whereas like the pursuit of making oxygen and hydrogen and water in the lunar environment obviously enables um, space travel, it enables a more sustainable approach to space travel and the kind of living off the the land facet to it. And then, you know, you look at what the biggest problems are that are facing humanity, fundamentally clean water, right? Um, and, and, and I think, you know, to, to that extent, some of the work we're doing is on purification of water. I think there's um, what's known and uh, foreseeable of what's going to come from that and doing that work in the lunar environment. And then, 
you know, with space technologies, there's always what's unknown and the happy accidents that happen and the happy technologies that get invented along the way that I think can help address the biggest problem facing Earth. So um, in regards to, uh, because something you just said kind of inspired another question. Um, You're talking about hydrogen and oxygen being such a critical part. Obviously it is. And so we have, for example, ULA and Centaur 5 running off of hydrogen and oxygen with the RL-10s. We've got um, Blue Origin doing the same thing. We have SpaceX not doing that. And there's there's a lack of methane and also a lack of carbon, as far as we know, on the moon to make it with the Saboteur method. Do you see that being a problem for Lunar Starship? Yeah, so um, yes and no. Um, oxygen is most of the problem, right? So if you've solved the oxygen problem, you've you've solved most of the mass of the propellant. Um, and if you can get 70, 80% of the mass of the propellant from the moon, then that's a huge boost in terms of efficiency, um, efficiency of refueling uh, of everything else. Then you know, there, there is carbon on the moon. Um, I think we're still, um, and, and we think we can make methane on the moon uh, at our company, um, and we have some processes that we're, we're working on towards that. Um, but, you know, some of that remains to be seen. We still know very little about lunar resources, right? We know, we know a lot, and we have, you know, there have been considerable missions uh, uh, to the lunar environment, but in many ways it's looked at, at fairly homogeneous as someone was describing to me today it's like a giant piece of cheese is still how we're looking at it um you know and maybe you've got two types of cheese two or three types of cheese and that that, that's i think the crude way we are still analyzing the moon i think we have to get up there you need um missions like uh like viper to go forward so much for that right so much for that yeah we're we're screwed now oh man might as well pack it all up but uh but you know you need to do this kind of prospecting and data gathering and and gathering on kind of subsurface data um and and very specific um uh, areas of the moon to really understand at a more nuanced level what the resource availability is i think um you know i would question um a, a lot or a considerable amount of the the Artemis architecture. I think there's like, um, and that's probably a much lar- larger conversation about ways to question the the uh, Artemis architecture. And not that there aren't, you know, um, a lot of smart minds or, or or good people involved, but you know, a lot of it um, revolves around like mining the South Pole, right? And the South Pole as kind of like the only area but there are other resources in other areas right and i think like we have to look at this all from a holistic perspective in order to uh develop those uh supply chains fully can you give me an example in regards to i mean you just brought up something that actually you're not the first person to talk to me about that saying that artemis is so focused on shackleton crater south pole etc can you give me some examples of other regions of the moon that you think would have advantages resource wise over that region i mean so um e- equatorial landings are much easier than polar landings right and so there's an argument to be made just on ease of access right um and accessibility um you know there are lots of benefits to the to being in the poles right but there are also lots of challenges um and i think like we need to look at all of these things um if you're just looking for kind of shallow regolith for oxygen um, is the South Pole the best place to operate? I don't really know. Um, you know, I think over time you will see um, presences built up in multiple areas of the moon. Um, you know, Artemis is one thing, and it, it, it's one set of space agency driven, international uh, driven ob- objectives. Um, but I think lunar development is a broader context, right? Um, and lunar development will. Um, you know, you're going to find areas that have the kind of highest and best use. Um, And, uh, you know, I don't think we know all of what those are today. Um, I think, like, we still have to go to some of these areas and explore and and, and see what's there. Um, um, And as we close the technological gaps, of which there are a number of gaps, um, you know, we'll, we'll start to open up these new novel business cases. Um, part of the idea around the South Pole is the, like, ease of access of sunlight, right? But um, 
something like nuclear power opens up other areas of the moon to permanent presence. Um, you know, we have, we are developing a, a nuclear reactor for the moon. We have the highest TRL nuclear reactor um, for space uh, of any company in the world. Um, and we are, um, you know, we think we can enable power and lunar night survivability um, in any area at a very low mass and cost. Um, and right now, you know, if you think about the architecture of, of CLIPS missions, again, with, you know, no offense to any of the CLIPS companies or, um, you know, huge technological feats, uh, amazing, incredible work. But when you think of the cost per mission that we are sending stuff up to die, best case scenario after two weeks, um, it seems really stupid to me. Um, and it should seem stupid to anyone if we can, you know, the, the idea being if you can send up um, a lander and that lander has a nuclear power source and that nuclear power source can keep anything that comes to that area for the next 10 years alive through the night, um, then all of a sudden your uh, return on investment just increases exponentially on successive missions. So tell me more um, about, it's interesting that the, the way the conversation is evolving here, tell me more about your, your nuclear reactors and your nuclear technology. What is it about it uh, that, uh, that, ma that uh, makes it distinctive from the competition and what makes it uh, useful on the moon as opposed to other applications? Yeah, so so maybe fundamentally it is, it is dual use, right? It has applications on Earth and in space, and we're pursuing those kind of dual use cases. Dual use being primarily kind of like Arctic to replace uh, a diesel power. You know, again to that philosophy or ethos of the company, it's around solving long term problems in space that solve problems on Earth. So we we started, we were working on on a, on ISRU. Um, and we realized that the gap was energy, right? Um, both lunar night survivability and access to sufficient thermal and electrical energy to do ISRU. Um, and solar wasn't going to close that gap, right? Solar can augment. It, it is uh, part of what I would call a holistic system. And, you know, um, many people view these things as like, it's this, it's power beaming or it's solar or it's nuclear. It's likely some combination of all the above. I think like this the this or that philosophy is a dumb philosophy um uh you know we need kind of hybridized solutions that um uh, balance the benefits of multiple systems um so so we started developing it around uh three years ago we're working with the canadian government we've been funded by the canadian space agency for our work in nuclear and we have effectively one of five contracts in the planet for for nuclear for um a lunar environment there's been three done in the in the states and and uh one in the uk um, and, and we think we're at a, a higher technology standpoint. We are starting with some a legacy a technology. We're working with the Canadian government um, uh, around kind of a heritage technology, which I, I can't get into too much details on. But, um, but we're, we're, we're in the kind of like 100 kilowatt range um, uh, of thermal energy. And we think we can deliver, you know, reasonably 20 or 30 uh, kilowatts of, of electric power in the next um, three or four years. Um, for the lunar environment. Now, of course, you need, you know, government funding and the demand and all that, um, as well as landers that could land without crashing, because, you know, I think like to put a reactor on a lander that crashes, um, although although technically not a big problem is probably, you know, a bit of a, a PR nightmare um, for governments. And I think that, you know, they'll want to see um, uh, stable, predictable landings before putting a reactor on the moon. But um, so, so, so that's kind of why we've gotten into it. We see nuclear as really the enabling factor um, for lunar night survivability, as well as for kind of heat and power in the lunar environment um, and kind of a um, precursor or kind of parallel path to, to ISRU um, to enable both the process heat um, as well as just the the survivability of like a, a fleet of rovers. Again, to send up rovers which die after two weeks, um, great to prove an ISRU process works, but to actually mine, um, even at the smallest scale, you're gonna have to have lunar night survivability, right? Um, to spend $500 million on equipment to send it up there for it to not survive more than two weeks is just, you know, it's kind of a fruitless endeavor. Um, as a, an ISRU company, I get asked, like, when are you going to send up rovers to start, you know, mining on the moon? And when are you going to start mining on the moon? It's like, well, there's, there's no point, right? Like, um, we can demonstrate and put up a payload, and we have a metallurgical process that we're advancing, um, uh, again, funded by the Canadian Space Agency. We're the prime contractor in Canada, really, on, on ISRU, and we've won about... Um, 
uh, four or five contracts on various parts of our ISRU process and and uh, terrestrial kind of spin out uh, technologies to that to apply uh, that metallurgical process to um, uh, other areas on Earth, like making cleaner metals, purer metals, um, potentially some uh, um, you know swarm robotics and 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 uh, manufacturing in situ resource manufacturing. Um, but, but, you know, all of it is, 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 is not, is, is, you know, without, is pointless to do, um, if you don't have sufficient power to survive up there, right? Um, it doesn't make economic sense. So, real, one of the, just to, to take you in one more direction yeah. here, because I could talk to you all day, but uh, we're, we're running a little short on time. Um, again, I, in, I didn't expect to be talking to you so much about nuclear, and, I, and I, I find myself wanting to. China has a plan for a full megawatt um, for their reactor. So, a, a two-part question here. Number one, what could they want to use that for? And and number two, what do you think the the what are the consequences of China establishing what you're trying to do on the moon ahead of the West? Are there consequences to that? Do they have similar ambitions? Why do we need to have a sense of urgency in in doing what you want to do first? Yes, there's a couple different facets to it. So I'd say like everything in space when you're when you're planning these these lunar missions, and again, I'm I'm no expert in that, right? I, I know a little bit, but um, you know, it comes down to mass and power budget, right? And so if you have a megawatt, you have a one megawatt power budget, um, and so you can put a lot of things up there. You can power a lot of things up there, and then you know that's in a, and that's base load power, right, for thermal energy and and survivability. In addition to that, you can build solar farms and, and other stuff. So, you know, a, a megawatt would enable a, a, a lot of stuff. Um, I think in China, getting there first, um, you know, it's definitely an issue, right? Um, and it's an issue in nuclear, but it's also an issue for ISRU, right? Um, China has recovered samples of helium-3 um, from the moon already. They have re recovered samples and identified samples of, like, critical minerals, they have locked up 90% of the critical mineral supply on Earth. They are very uh, long-term oriented, long-term thinking oriented. And, and we in the West suffer from very short-termism. We're on the political cycles. We're, you know, four years, two years of, you know, various administrations and, and their own priorities. You know, new politicians, new bureaucrats come in. Great ideas get thrown out uh, so that they can spend two years thinking up new ideas so they can put their personal imprint on things. And it's, uh, again, a completely fucking inefficient exercise, right? Um, and, and so, um, you know, China is moving fast and they are executing at all levels. Um, and fundamentally, in some ways, we are squandering time, quabbling and figuring out a plan. You know, I think like where we see nuclear... Right. Uh, in, in particular is like, let's get our solution we think can get up there and establish stuff. Um, you can bring up better technologies later. You can build off that. We need to start building somewhere. Right. I think like let's start building infrastructure and building blocks that we can build off. Once you have power, you can build off that. You can build ISRU. You can start to build fuel supplies. Um, you can start to build kind of permanent infrastructure. We need to build permanent infrastructure and build it as quickly as possible um, and, and, and find a way to um, move faster in a coordinated fashion. Obviously, the international alliances help with that because it's stickier. It's harder for individual countries to back out of things because, you know, it's, it's, it's egg on their face, right? Um, and uh, politicians, like anyone, do not like to be embarrassed, right? Um, and so, so to the extent that they can avoid that, um, uh, it's a good thing. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks so much. A very insightful conversation. Looking forward to the viewers uh, checking this out. So thanks again for your Thank time. You for having me on.